Medo eu não tenho, porque agora qualquer coisa que acontecer comigo, o culpado vai ser. Se eu cair... And she could not be more wrong. Shortly after, Elisa Samudio went missing. And her baby was found alive in a slum in Rio de Janeiro. It is said that sometimes money and fame can be a curse. And in this case, it was. Hello all! Welcome to 1001 Brazilian Crimes with Christy. Today I will be talking about Elisa Samudio's murder. This is the plot of one of the crimes that shocked the entire country. This case involves a goalkeeper at the height of his career, an unwanted pregnancy, a missing body, and a story with doses of mystery. Twelve years ago, Elisa Samudio was murdered in Belo Horizonte. Unfortunately, her body was never found. This case happened back in 2010 in Brazil. It became widely known in the country as it involved celebrities, betrayals, and murder. Elisa Samudio was born in 1985 in Foz de Iguaçu, south of Brazil. The city is known for containing the world's most extensive waterfall system and being the country's third most popular touristic destination. However, there's a bad side to everything. The city borders Argentina and Paraguay, making it ideal for drug and gun trafficking, causing it to be really unsafe. In fact, it presents the highest rate of teenage murders in the whole country. Elisa was the daughter of the farmer Sonia Fátima Silva Moura with the architect Luis Carlos Samudio. Unfortunately, their relationship was not the best from the beginning. Luis was always abusive towards Sonia. When Sonia got pregnant, Luis insisted on her terminating the pregnancy. Still, she did not budge and gave birth to Elisa. Over time, Sonia fled her abusive relationship. She moved to the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, leaving Elisa behind with her father as she had no financial conditions to care for her. It's unclear how old Elisa was when her mother fled. Some sources say she was 4 years old, while others say she was only 6 months old. Sonia then remarried, having a son. She only used to see Elisa occasionally, as she still feared Luis. Elisa went to Mato Grosso do Sul to live with her mother when she was 10. However, it lasted only for a year. According to an anonymous friend of the mother, Elisa seemed distant, hurt, afraid, and not so talkative when she arrived. Then, for unknown reasons, she went back to live with her father. Elisa was a kid that, even through her hard childhood, still had a passion in life. Soccer. She loved playing as the goalkeeper in her city's soccer team. She wanted to pursue a career playing in the national soccer team. However, she stopped playing as she realized she lacked the motivation to follow this path. The salary paid by a small team was low, and she did not even like exercising that much to start. Not long after, like many other girls her age, her new dream was to become a model. For that, she knew that her odds of being noticed were higher if she moved to the most populous cities in Brazil, São Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. She was 18 when she finally moved to São Paulo to try to make her dreams come true, starting a new life with her whereabouts unknown to both of her parents. Her hopes of becoming famous, however, were short-lived. Instead, she learned how harsh life in the big city could be, especially in her case, alone, not knowing anyone. At 20, through her hardships, she had to start making adult films to make ends meet, as the cost of living in a big city could be really high. Her liking for soccer did not go away. She wanted to be included in the soccer world, even if it was to be indirectly. So she frequented several parties with celebrities, especially those including soccer players. They were super attractive in her eyes, so this was her opportunity to meet them and possibly start a relationship. Drugs, alcohol and sex were abundant at those parties. And that's how it is claimed that Elisa met one of the most renowned co-keepers in the country back in 2008. 
Bruno Fernandes das Torres de Souza. Bruno was born in the city of Ribeirão das Neves in 1984, in the Minas Gerais state. His childhood was also tough. His parents had drug problems and abandoned him with his grandmother when he was just three months old. He always preferred soccer over his studies, but his grandmother always ensured that he attended school. She even asked Bruno's former girlfriend, Diane Rodriguez, to help him study. However, Diane's father was strict. The couple could only see each other on the weekends. Bruno's grandmother then came out with a solution to kill two flies with one slap, suggesting that they could study together during the weekdays to see each other and still obtain good grades at school. He eventually asked Diane to marry him, and she said yes. They had a child together and struggled to make ends meet. At this point, he still played in a small soccer team, earning peanuts. Diane had to work after coming back from school so that they could feed their son. In a certain way, he was immature to take on his family responsibilities. There was even an episode in which he got extra money at work, spending it all on car gear before returning home to an empty fridge. Luckily, due to his exceptional soccer skills, he was recruited by bigger soccer teams. As a result, he started earning more money and finally could give his family a comfortable life. He bought his grandmother and in-laws new houses in better neighborhoods, and his wife and kids could finally have a full fridge and all the comfort money could buy. On the other hand, he got drunk with wealth and fame soon after, changing his personality and values. He started partying hard, spending money, drinking, and cheating on his wife with several women. Diane even forgave him for his cheating a few times, but enough was enough, and she asked for a divorce when she could not handle it anymore. Not long after his separation, paparazzi spotted him with one of his lovers, the dentist Fernanda Gomes de Castro. Soon after, he assumed her to be his new girlfriend. At the same time, he was still attending parties and going out with other women. At one of those parties, he supposedly met Elisa in a, um, let's say, group fun. When she fell pregnant, there was a high probability of him being the father, as he was the only one not using protection. He did not want a child with a person he was not in a relationship with and denied being the child's father. He asked her to terminate the pregnancy, but she refused. He then restarted ignoring her calls when she began demanding he pays for her living expenses. At the same time, he was skeptical and claimed that anyone at the party could have been the child's father. He gave the responsibility of dealing with her to his manager and best friend, Luis Enrique Romão, known as Macarrão. Macarrão met Bruno when they were children. Like Bruno, Macarrão also had the dream of becoming a soccer player. Still. He could not play anymore after sustaining an injury just before a test to join a team. He then followed Bruno's whole career and became his manager once Bruno's career took off. Macarrão had a problem though. He was overly possessive with Bruno. As his manager, Macarrão used to spend Bruno's money on his own expenses, including expensive clothes, gold chains and whatever he felt like buying. Bruno not only allowed it, but also used to spend a lot of money on expensive things, including throwing extravagant parties. The main problem of this relationship was that Macron was in charge of solving every single thing for Bruno in life, no matter what it took. When Elisa was five months pregnant, Bruno called her at 2 a.m. and told her he wanted to talk to her. She gave him her home address, where she lived with a friend. She woke her friend up and let her know she would meet Bruno in his car in front of the house, just in case. While they were talking, Macarrão arrived and entered the car with another friend, Russo, an ex-military police officer. They had a gun. The three started threatening her to take a medicine called Cytotec, known as misoprostol in English. This medication is used to treat stomach ulcers, induce labors, and help with postpartum bleeding. 
It can also terminate pregnancies, effective between 66 and 90% of the time. They failed, so she was taken to Bruno's apartment, where she was beaten and forced to take a mixture of medications unknown to her at gunpoint. She passed out and only woke up at 2 p.m., spending 12 hours of horror in that apartment. They made her promise to terminate the pregnancy as soon as possible, and that they would collect her in two days to go to the deliberate miscarriage clinic. Ending a pregnancy is illegal in Brazil, excluding certain strict circumstances, with one to three years of prison for the pregnant woman and one to ten years for the doctor that practices it. So they would probably be taking her to an underground clinic, which is dangerous for the woman. In fact, statistics from 2018 showed that one woman dies every two days in Brazil with complications of terminating a pregnancy without the support of a qualified doctor. They threatened to kill her, her family and her friends if she reported the events to the police. She agreed in order to get away from that situation and save her life. The first thing she did when she left was to go to the police station and call the reporters. She thought that if she talked to the media, he would back off, knowing that he would be the first suspect in case anything happened to her. But as we know, that did not impede him at all. Medical results confirmed only after her disappearance that they found abortive medicine in her system. Luckily, this medication is ineffective for terminating pregnancy after a person is four months pregnant, so her babe survives. She asked for a restrictive order on the law called Maria da Penha, which protects women under domestic violence. Still, the judge denied it, saying that she did not have an intimate relationship with him. According to the judge, the law has as its goal the protection of the family, whether it comes from a stable union or marriage, as well as aims to protect the woman in an infected relationship and not in a purely casual and sexual relationship. So, it means that, even though she was pregnant by him, nothing could be done to protect her. And this sentenced her to death. She then moved to her friend's mother's house in São Paulo until she gave birth to her son, whom she named Bruno after his father, with the nickname Bruninho, a diminutive of Bruno in Portuguese. Her lawyer kept fighting for Bruno to pay Elisa's child support and recognize the paternity of her son. Two months after Bruninho was born, a soccer player friends with Bruno got attention in the media for physically assaulting his girlfriend. To support him, Bruno gave an interview saying, That already showed his personality and views about relationships. Four months after Bruninho was born, Elisa received a call from Bruno, telling her he wanted a DNA test on Bruninho, so that he could be sure he was his father before assuming paternity and getting into an agreement about child support. She was then taken to a fancy hotel in Rio de Janeiro, where she stayed for a month. On the 4th of June 2009, Macarrão and Bruno's cousin collected Elisa at the hotel in Rio de Janeiro. Then, they took her to the state of Minas Gerais, where Bruno had the ranch. From then on, Elisa had only a single contact with friends. No one else ever heard from her again. On this day, Macarrão had previously talked to Elisa 73 times on the phone, including when he was having a tattoo done with the phrase Bruno and Maca, a friendship that not even the strength of time will destroy, real love. From this point on, the story gets really confusing. Several versions have come to light about what followed. I'll be mentioning the most likely one. When Elisa got into Macarrão's car, Bruno's cousin, 
that could not be named back then by the media as he was under the legal age, then nicknamed Menor, got out of the trunk of the car holding a gun. Elisa got scared and started screaming. She removed the gun from him and tried to shoot, but the gun was empty. So then Menor got the gun back, hit her over the head three times, loaded it, and threatened her until they got to the ranch. Once there, Elisa and Brunin were separated in the house, with Elisa locked up in one of the bedrooms. Fernanda, Bruno's girlfriend, was the one taking care of Brunin. The next day, on the 5th of June 2009, Bruno's soccer team had a crucial match, in which they lost. Shortly after, Bruno went to his ranch. Elisa continued to be locked up in a bedroom, frequently beaten. Finally, she was forced by Macajon to call her friends, telling them she was fine and that Bruno would give her an apartment in the capital of Minas Gerais and money. That was the last contact anyone ever had with her. Three days later, on the 8th of June, two friends of Bruno tried taking Bruno's car to a car wash, but they were stopped on the way by the police, and the car got apprehended for some problem with the documentation. It had blood inside, but was not noticed by the police at the time. Four days later, on the 9th of June, Bruno had a barbecue with his friends outside the house on his ranch, with loud music to muffle any possible scream from Elisa. Usually, his house was open for the guests to shower after leaving the pool, but the whole place was locked at this time. The guests could see the housekeeper, Elenilson Vitor da Silva, coming and going but always locking the doors. Five days later, on the 10th of June, Macarrão and Menor collected Elisa in a car, and Bruno left in another car with another one of his cousins, Sergio Rosa Sales. They went to the house of Marcos Aparecido dos Santos, known as Bola, another ex-military police officer. Bola followed them in his motorbike. Once at Bola's house, Elisa said she could not handle being beaten anymore. Bola told her not to worry and that she would not be beaten anymore, but would die. She got desperate and asked him not to kill her, but he tied her hands and strangled her to death. It is said that Macarrão started kicking her lifeless body. Bola told Bruno and the others at the crime scene that he would cut her into pieces and give her pieces to his dogs, and he asked them if they wanted to see that. They rejected watching that scene and went back to the ranch. For the record, the police had tests done and proved that his dogs did not get involved. They also intended to kill Bruninho, but changed their mind on the spot. They could not go through with that. Bruno, Macarrão, and Sergio returned to the ranch with the baby then. They burned Elisa's clothes, documentation, and cell phone. On the 24th of June, the police received an anonymous call informing them that Elisa had been beaten to death on Bruno's ranch and her body buried in Esmeraldas, a city of Minas Gerais. The next day, on the 25th of June, Bruninho was found in a house in Ribeirão das Neves, Minas Gerais, with a friend of Diane, Bruno's ex-wife. So Diane was taken to the police station and arrested for kidnapping Bruninho. Two days later, on the 27th of June, Luis Carlos Samudio, Elisa's father, went to Contagem in Minas Gerais to pick up his grandson who was in a shelter. On the 6th of July, Menor was taken by an uncle to the homicide police station in Rio de Janeiro, where he gave details about Elisa's kidnapping and murder. He was then taken to Minas Gerais, where he helped the police get to Bola's house. At the door, terrified, Menor peed in his pants. On the 8th of July, Sonia, Elisa's mother, gets custody of Bruninho. Unfortunately, why the judge favored Sonia over Luis was not published. However, Elisa's father was sentenced in 2005 to eight years in prison for abusing a 10-year-old girl who was believed to be his daughter. On the 9th of July, Bruno and Macarrão were arrested by the police in Rio de Janeiro. At the end of the night, they were taken to Belo Horizonte at the request of the Minas Gerais police, who also obtained preventive arrests against several other suspects. 
During investigations, Elisa's blood marks were found on Bruno's car. On the 29th of July, the investigation into the disappearance of Elisa was concluded. Bruno and the others were charged. At this point, Elisa was considered dead by the police. The police also checked if her body had been chopped up in Bola's house, and there was no evidence to confirm that. So, considering it all, it's unclear what happened to her after she was strangled. The police also investigated the possibility of her body being concreted into the wall. But, again, no evidence was found. What we know for sure is, to date, the body has not been located. During the trials, the sentences were Bruno, 22 years and 3 months in a semi-open regime for being the crime's mastermind. Macarrão, 15 years in a semi-open regime for qualified homicide. Bola, 22 years for a murder and concealment of the corpse. But he ended up under house arrest due to the pandemic. Fernanda Castro, Bruno's lover. Three years in prison, but it was replaced by community service. More people were convicted, with lesser sentences. In 2019, Bruno was hired by a soccer team in Postos de Caldas, Minas Gerais. Still, shortly after, the contract was terminated because of the backlash it had in the media. In August 2021, Sergio tried to sleep with the wife of a drug dealer and was shot to death in Minas Gerais. In July 2022, Bruno was hired by a soccer team in São Gonçalo, Rio de Janeiro. In September 2022, Menor was killed by drug dealers in a slum of Rio de Janeiro. It seems he had been out of jail for only two weeks when he was tortured and killed. He had been previously arrested for drug dealing. The most recent update of this case comes from the 27th of October this year. Bruninho sued his father for his mother's death and will receive a payment of 650,000 reais, equivalent to $128,000. As Bruninho is underage, he is represented by his grandmother, Sonia, Elisa's mother. Sonia mentioned that the most heartbreaking moment for her was when Bruninho asked her where his mother was buried, and she did not have an answer. Even today, on the one hand, some still blame Elisa for getting pregnant by a famous soccer player, calling her Maria Chuteira, which in Portuguese means the denigrative term gold digger in English, but that looks for soccer players. On the other hand, Many say that all she wanted was for him to assume paternity, give her an apartment, and pay child support for their kid, nothing more. He was making $50,000 per month at the time. Now, regarding him being hired by soccer teams, again, people are divided between the ones who disapprove of him recovering his career in the soccer fields, and those who thought he needed an opportunity after being released. However, what everyone agrees with is that Bruninho was the biggest victim of it all. Growing up without a mother and a father that does not want him and committed a crime against his mother. So many crimes happen because of people's greed. This is one of them. Let me know if there's another Brazilian crime you'd like to hear about. See you in the next video, next nightmare in 1001 Brazilian crimes.